Good morning and welcome to the life and love of Rush Creek Christian Church. My name is Dan Davis. I'll be your serving elder today. Please go ahead and get your communion elements ready so that you can participate in communion with us later on in the service. We'd like to thank you for your contributions to Rush Creek Christian Church and remind you of the three ways that you can contribute. You can go to the online application, Givelify, or you can use online banking wherein the bank will generate a check and send it out to the church. Or you can just go ahead and write a check and send it on out here. Let us, let us prepare our hearts and minds now for worship. Hi, it's Valeska. I'm here with our stuffed animal friends at my house for a children's sermon. We hope all of you are staying healthy. <clears throat> when I was a little girl, I really liked flashlights. Flashlights for, were great for playing outside in the dark and you wanted to chase your friends around and not trip and fall on the grass. Flashlights were great when my, your mother and father turned off the light and you were supposed to go to sleep at night and you wanted to go under the covers and read some more of your favorite book. I also liked flashlights because I was not a big fan of the dark. 
When I would wake up at night and everything else was dark in my room in the house, I would get scared. And even though my parents told me there was nothing to be worried about, if my closet door was open just a little bit, I imagined all kinds of scary things inside my closet that I couldn't see. Or when the cars drove by outside the house, the shadows on the walls would move and that just looked a little spooky to me. And on my bookcases, I couldn't see books. I only saw strange shapes. I wasn't sure what they were. So even though I probably knew I didn't need to be scared, I was. I would take out my flashlight and I would turn it on and instantly I was reassured. <laughs> I could see that in my closet there were only shoes and clothes and I could see that the shadows going across my walls were really only from the headlights outside and I could see that everything on my bookshelves were really just books and nothing scary at all. So having the light made me feel so much better. Though, sometimes after I turned out my light and I went back to sleep and I'd open my eyes again, I was scared once more. A lot of kids are scared of the dark. In fact, some grown-ups are too. Um, it's really nice to have something like a flashlight that we can just turn on and feel better. Um, we can see in the dark and so we're less likely to get lost or to fall and hurt ourselves or to see things that maybe really aren't there, okay? So flashlights are a really nice tool, but as Christians, we have something else besides the flashlight that we can use, and that's God's light. If you look at the Bible, the people who wrote the Bible describe God as light, or that we can have God's light in our hearts. So we can have a flashlight in our hand, but God's light we can have in our heart and in our head. And God's light helps us to not be afraid. It helps us to see things a little bit more clearly. It helps us from getting lost or feeling like we don't know which way to go. God's light can make us feel more connected and not alone. There are a lot of really nice things that God's light can do for us. And the way that you can find God's light is by prayer. When you pray, you're asking God for his help and you're opening yourself up to God's light and his love and his guidance. And so by asking for that help, God can then give you that strength and that comfort to know that you're not in the dark and you're not by yourself and you can feel better right away, just like turning on a flashlight. So the next time that you get worried or scared or you don't know what to do, Think about God's light and ask for it to come into your heart. Let's finish with some prayer. Dear Lord, it is easy to get afraid and to feel like we are in the dark. Thank you for shining the light of your love on us to help us feel better, to see things more clearly, to feel less lost and more connected to you. We love you very much. Amen. Thank you.
as we pray, we hold in our hearts several members of our congregation who have the virus. We continue to pray for the medical professionals, the personnel who are working tirelessly in their efforts to heal those who are sick. We also surround in prayer Jerry Price and his family at the death of his father this week. We pray for Vic Taylor, who's in the hospital. So let us pray. You are the one, O oh God, the one who called our ancestors, the one who nourished them each day, the one who led them to the promised land. You are the one whose glorious presence is revealed in the birth of Jesus the Christ, the one whose grace is poured out through his life, the one whose very essence is loving kindness. We offer our gratitude as we bask in the light of Christmas, the light that shines among us still. Yet we are fickle. Even though we are mere days past Christmas, we put away boxes, we turn the calendar page, we lose the joy we so recently celebrated. And in truth, it's hard to be joyful in this season, in the midst of so much suffering. So we pray to you, we pray for courage that those who face overwhelming odds will know your presence, bringing them confidence. We pray for energy that those who are exhausted from the struggle will know the renewal of their passion. We pray for comfort as so many have died in this season. Let all who mourn know your peace, restoring their souls. Because we know you are the one of new beginnings. You are the Lord who makes all things new. At the beginning of this new year, call us and we will follow. Call us close to your own heart. Teach us to love you with our whole being. Make compassion our middle name. Help us never tire of the good that can come as we grieve with those who know loss as we share our resources with your people everywhere. Teach us to love with our minds. As we begin a new year, we would grow in wisdom. Help us seek the knowledge that will transform our world. Teach us to love you with our strength. Let us work for justice in every situation. Guide us as we seek paths of reconciliation in our families, in our nation, and around the world. May your word, born among us in this season, be written on our hearts, be at the forefront of our minds, and be on our lips in each new moment. In the name of the one we follow, whose life is the light of all people, we pray. Amen. Today I will be reading from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of God's power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to the eternal purpose that God accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Him, and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, you may be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, and grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. 
May God bless the reading of this word. I have two favorite scriptures I want to share with you today. I know you've heard me say that before. And so if you're keeping score at home, this is the fourth and fifth of my favorite scriptures. Maybe sometime this summer, I'll give you my top 10 of favorite scriptures. You've already heard Dan share with you from Ephesians chapter 3. I want you to hold on to the phrase that Christ may dwell in your hearts. The other scripture is what we shared at Christmas Eve. After we've lit our candles, we've lighted this sanctuary with candlelight and sung together Silent Night. My favorite scripture for that moment is from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. There's some beautiful poetic passages. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. In Him was life, and that life is the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And then one of my favorite phrases. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul wrote about the Christ event in this way. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's from Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. The church word for this is epiphany. The church calls January 6th epiphany. It's, it's a Greek word. That means God's special revelation. It celebrates the visit, visit of the Magi to see the baby as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. For Matthew, there's no shepherds, no stable, no room in the inn problem, no census. Instead, just this 12-day journey of the wise men following that star pointing to Bethlehem for the great reveal. I understand that in our world, many of us have already put away Christmas. The tree was taken down while the wrapping paper was still warm because of the warp speed with which it was dispatched. Stores have already put out Valentine's items and maybe even St. Patrick's Day green. But in the church, we choose to celebrate Christmas beginning with December 25th and ending with January 6th because it's too big of an event to be handled in just one day. Technically, we should start singing Christmas carols on the 25th. Advent, the season of December, is for watching, for waiting, for hoping for what comes next, for what is not yet. One of my colleagues in ministry got his church to go along with that idea of waiting to sing Christmas carols till after Christmas, just one December. Just one December. They missed him after that. So this idea of epiphany, this revelation of God, is about joining. The joining of the fullness of God to frail, fragile human flesh in Jesus the Christ. My Greek professor, Dr. Sheldon Schertz, loved to unpack this first letter, this first chapter of the Gospel of John, of expanding and pulling out the meaning of every single word in that phrase. He would talk about the word putting on a body, putting on a human suit, and pitching a tent right in the middle of us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word put on a human suit and pitched a tent right in us. Theologians use a lot of words to describe and debate this. If you grew up Catholic or Episcopal or Lutheran, maybe you recited some of the creeds. The Nicene Creed says, We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence of the Father. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. 
true God, true human. Or maybe you memorized the Chalcedonian Creed of 451 AD. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, consubstantial with the Godhead and consubstantial with us, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of nature's being by no means taken away by the union. There's a lot more that gets confusing. It was probably written by attorneys in fine print. After all, who says inconfusedly and consubstantially? Rest assured, none of this will be on the test. But our scripture today suggests more. More than the joining of the divine to human, humanity in Jesus the Christ. Epiphany is about the joining of the divine to ourselves. The fullness of God dwelling with us. The filling of God's spirit in us. Epiphany is the revelation of this. God's secret. God's mystery. God's hope for humanity. You heard in our scripture that Paul prayed that out of God's glorious riches, we would be strengthened, that Christ would dwell in our hearts, that we would be rooted in love, that we would grasp how high, how deep, how long, how wide the love of Christ is for each one of us, and that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Let that sink in for a minute, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. That could take a lifetime for us to achieve. Yet it is a noble goal. So I invite you to consider how we begin to hold the fullness of God. Maybe you remember the story of the science professor who brought out a large empty jar and filled it with river rocks till it was up to the lid of the jar. She asked in her students if the jar was full and there was some mumbled response and some nodding ascension to that idea. But then she took some pea gravel, poured it into the jar to fill the spaces between those larger river rocks up to the brim. Is it full? More of them agreed yes Yes, it's full now. Out from under the cabinet, she brought a bag of sand. Began pouring the sand into the jar, and it filled even the spaces between the pea gravel. Again, up to the top. Now, it has to be full, right? Finally, she brought out a pitcher of water. It started pouring the pitcher of water till the fullness of the jar of water entered, surrounded, and filled between the spaces of the sand and the pea gravel and the river rocks until it was full. Is it too corny to think of the Spirit filling us, filling the spaces between the metaphorical rocks in our lives, filling the spaces between the spaces until we would overflow with the joy of God's grace in us. And if you remember a thing or two about geology, you remember what happens to rocks when river water flows over them. Just visit the Grand Canyon and imagine the Spirit of God flowing over the rough, rocky places of your soul and smoothing them, comforting you, bringing you back to wholeness, to holiness as the love of God pitches a tent in you. So, if you're in the habit of making New Year's resolutions, I invite you to consider just a few. The first is simple. Commit to regular attendance in worship 
already this year, you have perfect attendance by watching this video. But more than that, more than our praise to God who enjoys our praise, but doesn't necessarily need it. Showing up for worship is showing up for each other, is being together in worship, offering community and nurture and hope for our fellow Christians. When there are difficulties in our lives, coming to worship together is an important aspect of our healing and our sustenance as we make our way through. We are the body of Christ together in this place, and each one of us is valuable to the whole. So we show up for each other. And in addition to that, I invite you to think about making it a regular habit to do that on Sunday morning, as we used to do, as we will do not far into the future. To watch together, maybe text someone or call someone and agree to watch it at the same time. To make comments below this video so that others know of your presence, know of your encouragement, to share this on your social media platforms. Ask your grandkids. They'll help you do it. I know that that's a lot to ask. I mean, after all, who knew that video conferencing was going to be an important skill for our kindergartners? But it's something that we do to share the gospel with everyone around us, to watch and to share it with others. So the second resolution I invite you to make is, I think, more important than the first. It's for you to wake up and to say each morning, in me, the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Think about that. On your mirror, on your refrigerator, on the dashboard of your car, in me, the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. In fact, say it with me, wherever you are. In me, the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Couldn't that change your day? Couldn't that change your life? To say that the possibilities are endless. Paul wrote that our lives, our bodies, our souls are temples for God's spirit. It's good motivation to remind us to do honorable things with our bodies and our lives, to avoid temptation, to live a more godly life. You might think that this is a too proud of a thing to do, but I imagine, I mind you, remind you to loop back to the beginning of our passage where Paul writes about being a humble servant, humbly approaching the throne of God and recognizing that God pours into our hearts the forgiving spirit that in me, the fullness of God is pleased, pleased to dwell. And then lastly, I invite you to do something about it, which is really saying commit to doing one thing for someone else to pray about the needs of our world and discern where God is calling you and then following Christ into that particular ministry. What does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? Our lives are not canning jars to be sealed and put on a shelf for winter. Our lives are more like riverbeds where the Spirit of God flows over and around and through the rough places like an ever-flowing stream, living water then to be a source of life for other people. Being filled with the fullness of God could mean that the hurts and traumas we've experienced will be soothed and smoothed by the presence of God's Spirit flowing over us and through us. The Spirit isn't something we purchase and keep locked up for safety. The Spirit is something we share as freely as it has been given to us. Or think about it this way, uh, a medical model from John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople from the fourth century AD. And I quote, they who go to the physician have not merely to go there and nothing further. They have to learn how to treat themselves and to apply remedies. And so with us, when we come here, we must not do this and nothing else, 
We must learn our lesson and then apply it. End quote. Show up for each other. Say to yourself, in me, the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. And then, let the Spirit guide your steps. At the end of the day, give thanks to God for the day presented to you and look forward to the opportunities that come with the next morning. Amen. This is the essence of the fullness of God dwelling within Jesus the Christ. We know that on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. He blessed it and he broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is for you. And he also took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to them. And he said, this is the cup of the covenant, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take this and drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. May we share these elements representing Christ's body and blood given to us. Please pray with me. Lord, the arrival of a new year brings a great opportunity to renew our faith for you. It is also a wonderful time to renew the joy of salvation in our hearts as a new creation in Christ. Let us move into this new year knowing that God loves us and wants the best for us. Let us pray that the new year will be focused on healing ourselves through repentance and the renewing of our minds. We were not meant to live life alone. We can bring the light of hope into our hearts, into our home, and into our world. Amen. Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.